I love the smell of logistics in the morning. All right, Factorians, this is my factory. Based entirely on logistics bots with no trains or belts, it can launch its first rocket in under six hours and achieve 1,000 science per minute in under a day with about 30 UPS on my M1 Max MacBook Pro, 24 UPS if biters are turned on. And how did I build it? Well, as you can see here, I'm not building anything. This factory builds itself, and in this video I'm going to show you how. I recommend watching this video in order, but feel free to use the chapter markers to skip around if you want. Pretty much any self-expanding factory requires the Recursive Blueprints mod. This mod has really great documentation, so I don't want to go into too much detail here, but I'll give a quick overview. With Recursive Blueprints installed, you can build a Blueprint Deployer. This building can hold a Blueprint, Deconstruction Planner, or a Blueprint Book. You can send signals via the circuit network telling it where to place the Blueprint it's holding, and if it's holding a Blueprint Book, you can tell it which Blueprint you want it to place. So to make a self-expanding factory, you'll need a book of Blueprints to lay out, and an automated way to tell the Blueprint Deployer which one to deploy. I'll get into what's in my Blueprint book in a moment, but for the logic, I use the Moon Logic Combinator mod, which provides a Moon Logic Combinator, which can be programmed in Lua. This allowed me to write a sophisticated algorithm without having to build acres of Combinator setups. So before diving into the factory and getting lost in the weeds, let's talk about the algorithm that builds the factory. I wanted the factory to be capable of making not just science, but also the buildings needed to build new parts of the factory, and really any arbitrary product I thought I might need, like ammunition. So I designed the algorithm and the blueprints to be as modular and flexible as possible, and tried to avoid hard-coding things as much as possible as well. To that end, I came up with a system of tiers for all the products we would need to craft. The first couple tiers contain fairly basic ingredients, while the last tier contains space science, the most complex product we can craft. You may notice ore, oil products, and power aren't on this list. I'll cover them later. When choosing which blueprint to build, the algorithm looks at the demand numbers coming in on the red circuit network. Any item with a negative signal is in demand. If there is no demand for anything in Tier 1, we check if anything from Tier 2 is in demand, and so on. Once we find a tier where one or more items are in demand, we build a tile designed to manufacture the item with the most demand. I put every item in the lowest number tier that doesn't contain any of its ingredients. So for instance, green chips require iron plates and copper wire. Iron plates are in tier 1, and copper wire is in tier 2. This is important because if green chips and copper wire are both in demand, it probably means we should build copper wire assemblers first, since if there isn't enough copper wire, it doesn't matter how many green chip assemblers we have. Often, supply chain issues are caused by shortages of low-level ingredients, and if we take care of those, Suddenly, some of the higher tier products aren't in demand anymore. Now let's look at the blueprints that we're actually building. The smallest unit of construction in this factory is what I call a tile, and the 3x3 grid of these is called a mega tile. Most of the time, we'll expand the factory by building a blank mega tile, then filling each of the eight empty tiles with manufacturing tiles. Each manufacturing tile has a couple of responsibilities. It needs to keep manufacturing until it has one minute's worth of surplus in its provider chests, it needs to request one minute's worth of ingredients, and it needs to report to the Red Circuit Network any ingredients that are missing. Thus, the ingredient inserters are wired up to only work if there is less than one minute's worth of product in the provider chests. The requester chests report the number of ingredients they have to this combinator, which subtracts from the number of ingredients that are needed, and if the number is negative, meaning ingredients are needed, then that negative number is passed to the red circuit network. The first time we build a green chip tile, we may not have any copper wire tiles, so the green chip tile will report that copper wire is in demand. The algorithm will probably decide to build a copper wire tile next, now that that's in demand, and it will continue building them until copper wire demand is satisfied or a lower tier ingredient like copper plate is in demand. Power and oil are two concerns that won't fit onto a single tile and require special case mega tiles to handle properly. Initially, I had considered running the entire factory on solar power, and I designed a mega tile with a perfect balance of solar panels and accumulators. However, since each mega tile has to have at least one roboport, and roboports can use up to four megawatts when charging bots, it was actually pretty hard to break even, and I ended up with factories that were just giant oceans of solar dotted with islands of manufacturing tiles. My solution was to go nuclear, and design a nuclear mega tile with a 2x2 reactor neighbor bonus and a complex system of local circuits and combinators to figure out when to feed fuel to the reactors. Basically, 
Every couple minutes, we check if the steam in the storage tanks has gone below a certain threshold, and if it has, we feed fuel cells to the reactors. This way, we don't waste fuel cells keeping the reactors at 1000 degrees, and ideally only feed them when they go below 500. This is a complex dance, but it ends up saving a lot of nuclear fuel. The algorithm doesn't have any method for building or piping pump jacks, so all oil processing has to be based on coal liquefaction. This does mean that we have to start with a few barrels of heavy oil in the root megatile to kickstart the first oil processing megatile, but after that it's pretty smooth sailing. Coal liquefaction has some pretty wild product ratios and doesn't produce nearly as much light oil or petroleum as we would like. So if we have more barrels of heavy oil than light oil, we pump heavy oil into the eastern area to be cracked into light oil. Similarly, if we have more barrels of light oil than petroleum, we pump light oil into the southern area to be cracked into petroleum. Lastly, in the unlikely event that petroleum pipes get full while we're low on heavy or light oil, we have a pump that will turn on and feed this chemical plant, which will turn the excess petroleum into solid fuel, although this basically never happens. Our factory does place a premium on mining its own resources. If the resource scanner provided by the Recursive Blueprints mod detects a large amount of ore in an upcoming megatile, that megatile will be built as a blank megatile, even if we're in a power crisis, because we don't know when we'll come across ore again. Whenever we build a tile, we also scan for ore and build a mining tile if ore is present. The root megatile does have infinite chests that will supply a dribble of ore if there is negative amount in the red circuit network, but after about a dozen megatiles, we've usually got iron and copper ore and we don't need these anymore. So now that we've covered how the tier system and the tiles work, how do we kick this factory off? Well, the root megatile has what I call the Mall of Shame. These are rows of infinite chests that supply all the buildings we're going to use to build the factory. However, we're only going to use these until we have a tile that can craft the buildings. Under each infinite chest is a constant combinator that puts a demand for 10,000 of the building onto the red circuit network. This means the algorithm will try and build tiles that manufacture these buildings as soon as it can. Each manufacturing tile for these buildings reports to the green circuit network when it first successfully manufactures its product, and then the blueprint deployer at the bottom uses a deconstruction planner to remove the infinite chest, inserter, provider chest, and constant combinator, leaving only an arithmetic combinator that holds the number of products that were pulled from the infinite chest before it was destroyed. Okay, so once we have tiles for everything in the mall and we've built enough tiles to satisfy all the downstream demand, what do we do? Well, the algorithm sets a five minute timer, and if no products come into demand during those five minutes, we build a research tile. Like the manufacturing tiles, research tiles report their demand on the red circuit network, so this immediately creates demand for all seven sciences, and creating manufacturing tiles for those starts to strain demand on other products or create demand for products that we don't have tiles for yet, and eventually we get to the point where we've launched a rocket and have some production capacity for each of the seven sciences. At this point, usually about six game hours and 100 mega tiles in, the algorithm usually has to build out a ton of power to handle the load of all these tiles running continuously and backfill some of the slower tiles like rocket control units or rocket fuel that had built up surpluses. However, eventually we get to a point where we have enough power and production capacity to sustain the research tile, and if things stay that way for five minutes straight, we build a new research tile, and then whatever tiles are needed to keep up the pace. This phase of the factory continues indefinitely until, usually after over 500 mega tiles and 25 research tiles, we've achieved 1,000 science per minute. Up to this point, most of the footage I've shown you was gathered with biters turned off. But this factory can in fact defend itself and even achieve 1,000 science per minute, although it takes several days of real world time to get there. The factory starts with an artillery cannon that clears the area around the root megatile and keeps us free of biter nests for about 36 megatiles. After that point, the algorithm sets a flag for each time the factory reaches a corner, telling it to build an artillery station tile at the next opportunity. It's important that we clear biter nests before we try to build on top of land, since otherwise the blueprints will be incomplete and we have no way to detect or fix if that happens. In general, the factory expands a lot slower when dealing with biters. The algorithm waits until almost all construction bots are idle before surveying or building a new tile. And with biters attacking, this can take a lot longer since construction bots will be kept busy fixing and replacing damaged buildings, especially once behemoth biters start showing up. 
One addition I may add later is a way to inject one or two research tasks for artillery range after a certain number of megatiles, since the gaps in artillery coverage start to get close to the factory's outer layers when we get up to a few hundred megatiles. All right, to wrap this up, let's take a critical look at this factory and evaluate its pros and cons. Pro, small tiles mean low stakes. Believe it or not, this isn't my first self-expanding factory. I previously tried to build a trains and belts based factory, but the rail based tiles had to be huge. This meant that if my algorithm built the same tile twice by accident, it would lead to massive downstream demand spikes. The smallness of the manufacturing tiles ensure that if we build one too many for a particular product, we don't create too much downstream demand. And if we build up a surplus, it doesn't get so large that it prevents us from realizing that we don't have enough production capacity later on. This was the main reason I opted for this unconventional design, and I think it has paid off tremendously. Pro, fine grain measurements of supply and demand. In my previous factory, a rail tile would report a one on the green circuit network if it was missing a particular ingredient. In this factory, I know exactly how much of each ingredient is in demand, and the way the logistic network reports to the circuit network ensures that product that is in transit is accounted for as well. Pro, Transportation is simple. Admittedly, bots are the most brute force method of transportation in Factorio. However, I like the fact that if not enough stuff is going where it needs to go, I just add more bots until stuff is flowing. And if the number of bots means the robo ports become the number one power draw, we just build more power. And if the travel times get too long, the unsatisfied demand will cause us to overbuild manufacturing tiles until we're manufacturing everything close to where it's needed. I'll get into the inefficiencies in a moment, but I do find it elegant that this factory is able to address its own issues in a way that makes getting to 1,000 signs per minute possible. Con, UPS. Admittedly, for a lot of the factory's lifetime, this isn't an issue, and it's able to keep UPS above 60 for a couple hundred megatiles. However, by the time it's actually doing 1,000 signs per minute, it has slowed to half speed, which is a little unfortunate. I've seen reports of huge 10,000 science per minute factories built on top of bots, but it sounds like in order to do that, you have to basically design a mini factory that is self-contained and then stamp out several dozen copies with unconnected logistic networks. I wanted the algorithm to sort of design the factory as it goes, which means I pay the price in terms of inefficient layout, long travel times, more active bots at any given time, and therefore lower UPS. Con, water. I never got around to sorting out how to do offshore pump tiles. In order to do that, I'd probably have to add some sort of multi-phase blueprinting logic to the algorithm. For now, I have these infinite water pipes, which are definitely a cop-out. However, I do think the fact that they're bottlenecked by the barreling process makes the whole thing a little bit fairer. Con. Modules. I use level 3 modules all over this factory, which means I really should be crafting them in tiles. Unfortunately, the supply chain required for that is about as large as a 1,000 signs per minute factory alone, and by that point the UPS is so low it would take weeks to actually reach 1,000 signs per minute. So, for now, I've disconnected the combinators so we never actually build the tiles for them, and we just rely on the Infinitest forever. I should probably consider downgrading to level 1 or level 2 modules to make the factory more honest. However, that would require refactoring every manufacturing tile and solving potential issues like slower water barreling, so I have been putting it off. Some people might see things like the Moon Logic Combinator as a con and assert that I should have just used normal combinators. My guess is that would have required at least a 3x3 block of mega tiles just for combinators, and in addition to not liking that, I also like how much easier it is to comment code than to leave tons of text pins on the map. But hey, if you want to take a crack at this, I've linked a zip of the scenario in the description. Shoot your shot. Before I wrap up, I want to shout out a couple other self-expanding factories you should check out if you haven't already. Nifty Maniac's Grey Goo was what inspired me to try any of this in the first place, and my initial trains and belts factory was named the Grey Goo Express in homage. Aside from that, I didn't know of any other self-expanding factory projects until I started working on this video, when I found Droka's Joseph and Nielaus's Communities Factory. These do a much better job of the trains and belts concept than my initial factory did, and even take different approaches from each other, which is really interesting. I've linked both of them in the description. Now that you know how it works, you should try running this factory too. Go ahead and grab the scenario from the link in the description, get it running, and see if you can improve on it. I'd love it if automated factory design could become a new category of play for Factorio. 
Sort of like the way that tool-assisted speedruns have become a popular category of speedrunning. Now, I don't expect this to become a Factorio-heavy channel moving forward, but if you have any questions, leave a comment, subscribe, and I may do a follow-up answering some of them. But until then, happy hacking and stay building.